If you were to uh, Google modern soldier and click on images, you would find different uh, permutations of modern technical gear. Well, this is a picture of high tech back in Jesus' day. That is what a well-equipped Roman soldier would look like. Now, we don't talk much anymore about the militaristic images in the Bible, and that's usually for good reason. That's because Jesus' gospel is sort of uh, not compatible with the sword. However, there is a special case in which it is appropriate to talk militaristically, and you're going to hear that passage today from Ephesians. That's because we're dealing not with flesh and blood, but with a spiritual warfare. Please listen to the words of Paul. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against the enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Before I begin the sermon today, I would note that today, next week, and two weeks after that, uh, we are going to be talking about this book. Same kind of different as me. The characters in this book are the ones who will be sort of the centerpieces, if you will, of uh, these sermons. I'm saying this to you that in case you've not read this book, and many of you have, uh, they are available online uh, via ebook as well, and also the Barnes & Noble across from Chesterfield Mall are getting in 50 copies this week of the book for us, uh, because it is a fascinating true story, and after you read it, and hopefully after you hear these sermons, you will... Uh, see things maybe in a little different light about how the amazing gospel of Christ can break through human distinctions. Let us pray. Lord our God, as you moved in many wonderful and joyful ways throughout this service, please move your spirit into the words about to be spoken and heard into that which will be thought and felt, so that in all ways we honor the living Christ in our midst. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to talk today about sin. Up there, you will see what sin is. It's cigarette smoking, Coca-Cola guzzling, card playing, novel reading, dancing, opera, grand opera, living, pictures, tableau, charades, prizes, a prize fights, bull fights, dog fights, rooster fights, yachting, roller skating, football, baseball, curling, backgammon, billiards, checkers, chess, dice, polo, croquet, pool, golf, lawn, tennis, cricket, and what a cat. Uh, that's sin. It's actually sin as categorized in 1900 by a national meeting of a major denomination. I'm sure the list could have gone on because it's a piece of cake to pick out individual actions and say, oops, sin, 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 sin. That's sort of the way we are brought up. In the Methodist circles, we are brought up with, um, well, historically, the holy societies where small groups would meet each week to talk about how, whether they're living pure lives. And of course, especially the young people know that great Burl Ives song, I'm being facetious here, be careful little ears what you hear, be careful little ears what you hear. Have you heard that one voice? Oh, oh, take it now. For the Father up above is looking down at love, so be careful, little ears, what you hear. This is why I don't sing with one voice. <laughs> you understand? But that's the way we look at life, you know, sin. Yeah, well, be careful what you hear, what you see, what you say, things like that. 
And of course, we are to lead lives of purity as much as we can. That's what we're called to do. However, sin is much broader than what we see, hear, think, do. It really is. And that's what we're going to get into today. We're going to talk about societal sin and how we either intentionally or unintentionally are caught up in it. We're going to use as the focus one of the characters of the book, Mr. Denver Moore. Denver uh, was a sharecropper in Louisiana who found his way to the uh, cold, hard streets of Fort Worth, Texas as a homeless person. The book chronicles how he and Mr. Ron Hall, an international and very wealthy art dealer, met and surprisingly became friends. Next week, we're going to talk about Ron, and then a couple of weeks after that, we're going to talk about the amazing woman, his wife, Ron's wife, Debbie, who uh, brought them together. But let's focus a little bit upon that man, Denver. Sharecropper, that's not anything you hear much about anymore. Here's the way it worked, at least for Denver. For the first 30 years of his life, Denver Moore lived on plantations. He lived in a three-room shack on a plantation that was owned by the man, as he uh, called him. And Denver bought his supplies on credit from the man's store that was also located on the plantation. After Denver worked the fields, putting in the crop, tending the crop, and harvesting the cotton, uh, the, uh, the tally was made between what his income would be as given by the man and what his debt was, and not surprisingly, it was not exactly equal. But by the time the crop comes in, you owe the man so much on credit, your share of that crop gets eat up. And even if you don't think you owe that much, or even if the crop was especially good that year, the man weighs the cotton and writes down the figures, and he's the only one that can read the scale or the books. And you and I just thought slavery ended in 1865. You know what I mean? There seems to be something in individual and, and societal DNA that tends to be a predator upon other people. Abraham Lincoln, in his second inaugural address, put it very clearly in regard to slavery when he said, I, I find it strange that some men will wring their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. We continue doing that as a society, as a world. It seems to be like there's a predator mentality in the world. Billions were made by people selling inflated mortgages to families who could never afford them. Sweatshops are created in third world countries with people living in, in uh, or working in horrific conditions, making subsistence wages in order for there to be technology and clothing and coffee and food in the uh, uh, first world countries. We live and move and have our being in a world that seems to be a world that fractionalizes and factionalizes with the, uh, the powerful taking advantage of and using, if you will, the powerless. By the way, that's why I'm glad that we have a fair trade market every, every November here in this church, just to remind us of how we must consistently be conscious of the, the, the powers of the world, if you will. But even if we're conscious or not, so often we participate in it, even if it's looking at a homeless person and making an unconscious knee-jerk judgment. Well, Denver got tired of this. He got tired of not having a life that he could uh, find any hope in, and so he did something about it. All them years, there was a freight train that used to roll through Red River Parish on some tracks right out there by Highway 1. Every day, I hear it whistle and moan. And I used to imagine it calling out about the places it could take me, like New York City or Detroit, where I heard a colored man could get paid, or California, where I heard nearly everybody that breathed was stacking up paper money like flapjack. One day, I just got tired of being poor. So I walked out to Highway 1, 
waited for that train to slow down some, and jumped on it. I didn't get off till the doors opened up again, which happened to be in Fort Worth, Texas. <laughs> now, when a black man who can't read, can't write, can't figure, and don't know how to work nothing but cotton comes to the big city, you don't have too many of what white folks call career opportunities. That's how come I wound up sleeping on the streets. I ain't gonna sugarcoat it. The streets will turn a man nasty. And I had been nasty, homeless, in scrapes with the law, in Angola prison, and homeless again for a lot of years by the time I met Miss Debbie. You know, if you do uh, volunteer work at the bridge uh, down Centenary Church, our United Methodist uh, homeless sanctuary, if you will, giving lunches to the the homeless. If you volunteer down there, or if you go to Bush Stadium and you, you see folks with the signs on the corners, you don't really think about what got them to that point, do you? You, know, you don't think of them maybe having a sharecropper background from Louisiana. You don't think about the family situation or lack thereof that they were raised in, or the drugs, or the gangs. You don't think about uh, um, a bankrupt school system. You don't think about the trauma they might have gone through because we're so busy with our lives. We go on and we move and we, we go and do our checklist. And we don't really think that we live in a world that is quite content to let there be folks on the fringe, folks who don't have the equal opportunities that we might have, and they pay the price accordingly. No, Sin isn't just, be careful little ears, what you hear. Sin is also being very cognizant of the fact that we're a long way from the kingdom of God in this world. And that's what Paul is talking about. And that's why he uses the spiritual armor images, if you will. He starts by saying this, for our struggle, now remember we have a struggle. If you don't care about the inequality or the discrimination or the exploitation, you don't have a struggle. You're very content to go home this afternoon, watch the Masters on TV, do whatever you Cardinals win another ball game, do whatever, that's fine, without giving a second thought to what we're talking about this morning. But you're here because you are giving a second thought to the Scripture lesson and those words, because you know in your heart as a Christian, it is a struggle to be faithful to the gospel in a world that tries to snuff out the gospel, because our struggle is against rulers and authorities and against cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil. It is a struggle. Two weeks ago, we had a great Easter service in this place. Every one of us should have left us uh, singing the songs, uh, humming the hymns, feeling good about the message that Christ is alive. That is good news for us. It's bad news for the cosmic powers of this present darkness. Because they do not believe in equality. They do not believe in giving compassion to those who are downtrodden and hurting. They do not believe these spiritual forces of darkness, of evil, in giving justice to those who are uh, hurting because they're powerless. No. They make their living by wringing their money from the sweat of other people's faces. No wonder Paul starts in with saying, Christian, if you don't feel it's a struggle, you better check your own Christianity. But since it is a struggle, then you better have the right equipment. You better have the right attire, the right uniform. You better have the, the, uh, the belt of truth, truth, which means that you can see through all the propaganda, all the spin, all the Enron type things that will bend ethics on the sake, on the, upon the altar of greed. Do you know what I mean? You see through all of that because you know that there is a different kingdom coming into this world. That's what Jesus said. That's why the world's powers are, are trembling. Jesus embodied the kingdom of God that started uh, breaking forth into this world, and there's an anti-kingdom of God, if you will, that's doing everything in its power to stop. You proclaim the truth, and you say, I have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. You also then put on the breastplate of righteousness, Paul says. Righteousness. You do right. 
you take action and you stand for those who cannot stand up for themselves. And you give voice to those who have been silenced by the powerful. And you put on the, the shoes of peace. Peace. You proclaim the vision, the dream. You paint in vivid colors uh, the kingdom that, that Jesus envisioned and Jesus gave his life for in this world. I love how Dr. Martin Luther King described it in his famous speech, I Have a Dream, when he said, I dream of a time when sons of former slave owners and sons of former slaves can sit at the table of brotherhood. That's what we proclaim in this world. And it's very interesting what, what Paul goes on to say about the shoes of peace. He said, for shoes, put on whatever you have. Doesn't need to be the latest style. Doesn't even need to fit. But you put on whatever you have so that you can proclaim the gospel of peace. Don't let anything stop you from going out and proclaiming to the forces of this world that there's a new sheriff in town there's a bigger kid on the block. His name is Jesus, and he's going to stand up for those who have been silenced. You know what I mean? That's what we are called to do. Dr. King, as you might recall, was thrown into a jail in Birmingham after a peaceful demonstration. And while he was in a Birmingham jail, eight white clergymen wrote him a letter. And parenthetically, one of those clergymen was a professor of mine in seminary, a retired bishop who talked about that. They wrote a letter to Dr. King saying, you got to take it slow, ease off the accelerator. Huh? No more antagonizing the whites, let due process of law take its course. And Dr. King wrote back in a famous letter from a Birmingham jail, which if you haven't read, you ought to read, and I need to read as a refresher. And he wondered at the white Christian moderate who would settle for societal order at the expense of social injustice. And he wondered how some Christians can paternalistically describe uh, and dictate the timetable for another person's freedom. In other words, the timetable for another person's dignity and for another person's respect and for another person's equal opportunity for resources, that timetable is now not later, it's now. There is an urgency. And I am so proud that Manchester United Methodist Church has this urgency written in its DNA because our vision statement, we're an inclusive, not exclusive, inclusive community of believers who love Christ deeply, worship Christ passionately, and serve Christ boldly. It's not just coming in here and feeling good. It's going out there and sharing that goodness, sharing that liberating gospel of Christ to all beyond the walls of this church. That's what we're about to do when, in this thing called faith in action. You know, there's an interesting footnote about the armor. The uh, armor of a Roman soldier was not just meant to um, be sort of scary to the opponents, you know, to the enemies, because it looks like a pretty scary figure up there, if you recall. But the armor was such, the shields were made such a way that they were meant to be uh, side by side. They were meant to almost interlock with other soldiers so that as one group, a hundred soldiers would be moving as one, terrifying the other, uh, terrifying the enemy. A Christian can do really good work beyond the walls of this church. But when over a thousand Christians get together wearing this uniform, a thousand of us wearing this uniform, that strikes terror into the hearts of the cosmic forces of this world. Don't ever think that we're not worshiping the last weekend of this month. Oh, we're worshiping. We're just worshiping in a very special way because over a thousand of us will be beyond the walls of this church preaching a sermon that's going to be done on a park, in a, in a city park, beautifying it and picking up litter so that that neighborhood uh, gains a little more respect. And the uh, anthems that day are going to be sung by us interacting with senior citizens in a, in a senior uh, residence and helping them in their apartments. 
And the prayers will be prayed by us uh, going into homes and helping fix them up, repair them for residents who have neither the resources nor the skills to do that. Our offertory will be given by going to different uh, grocery stores and soliciting food donations for the pantry at Shalom House, the shelter for homeless women. Do you get the idea? And do you know how the forces of the cosmic, uh, the cosmic forces of evil will tremble in seeing as one people in this uniform? That's what awaits us. That's what's exciting. Denver Moore died last year at the age of 75. I wish he could have lived to see what's going to be happening the last weekend of this month, because if he had lived, he would have seen the uh, brigade from this church go forth beyond these walls. He would have said one word, amen.